we're looking at the most popular, like the top 20 post-Vatican II buzzwords. These are the catchphrases, the words that you hear all the time. What do they mean? Do they even mean anything? Or are they just cloaks for weakness and weaponized ambiguity? I'm back with co-host Tim Gordon. We're going to talk about it today. Tim, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Awesome. Well, just a bit of housekeeping before we get into these post-Vatican II buzzwords. Uh, YouTube has announced that they will no longer push any notifications out through Google+. So if you're listening to us through Google+, it's not going to happen anymore. So everybody watching, if you like these videos, take a moment, hit the subscribe button beneath this video, and then hit the bell. And that bell will notify you when we put out a new show, usually Monday, Wednesday, Friday at noon central. Okay, that's all we needed to say. Catholic buzzwords. I mean, we, we originally were going to do 10, and then we came up with about 25. There's so many words. And the number one right off the list, these aren't in really any order, but the number one that Tim and I agreed on was pastoral. Pastoral. Huge. Everything since 1965 that's objectionable is cloaked over with, well, we need to be pastoral. Right. And this comes directly from the council, I believe, as well, well unlike a lot of Paul these. Paul the VI said it was a pastoral council, so he, he may have been yeah. the one that got the ball rolling. Yeah. yeah, from the time of the council, a lot of the other words that we'll discuss today have developed in the spirit of the council, which is a, a different thing. But when the council documents themselves, because we, we want to discuss um, – pastoral as not not so much its positive value but its privational value what 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 it substitutes what it surrogates for and what it surrogates for is the message this is not a doctrinal council you know this is what everyone out there hears well then what is it what what sort of animal is this considering that you know 20 22 councils and this is the first one that is non-doctrinal so it's best to start out talking about what they mean pastoral does not mean before even what does it mean well i don't think it has a definition i think it's a cloak i think you say to cardinal dolan well why why wouldn't you excommunicate legislator legislators or cuomo over pro-abortion laws and the answer would be well it's not really pastoral which right. just means I don't want to do it. <laughs> it, it does. It, right. That, uh, or, or, hey, why, why yeah. can't we have, <laughs> hey, everyone in our church, we have a high altar that was built in the 1920s in our old, you know, Polish parish. And everyone here, we, we would like to, you know, have the priest go back up to the high altar and not use the Akio one. Well, that's not really pastoral. Which means I don't want to do it. That That's ultimately, you're doing no... No BS, you know, a truth time. What does it mean? It means I don't want to do it. What they allege it means is difficult concepts or doctrines need to be massaged. Right. And 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 they would say not not modified, but they need to be massaged before they come out to the census fidelium. And in that massaging process, uh, there's a great cardinal Burke interview he once gave on it. I was looking it up for this, and I, it was one of those ones that escaped me. I think he gave it with LifeSite about three years back. And he said, well, obviously, pastoral, something that is by its nature pastoral, but not doctrinal. If what you mean is it violates doctrine in order to be massaged and to be handed on to the people, well, then it's anti-doctrinal and it's anti-Catholic. Um, and Which if it doesn't lead right. the soul to heaven right. and to the life of sanctity to become a saint, then it's not pastoral. That's right. So it's just full circle. You end up being not what you set out to be or claim to be. Right. And, and, and people do. I, I know you've heard me say this before, but it, it cannot be explained enough. It can't be broken down enough. I, I had I answer this question. At like a parents' night at high school, said what? 
what's an ecumenical council? What what is the what is that? I heard you talk about church history is basically a history class tracing all the twenty plus ecumenical councils. What is that? And I said, well, that, that's a that's a good question. Um, an ecumenical council is by its nature um, a gathering. Of, of all the bishops of the world, which is why it's ecumenical, where a challenge to the faith or a heresy is being uh, formally repudiated, anathematized, and the opposite, the prevailing opposite of that heresy is announced with the heresy itself being anathematized and the, the, the new, the new uh, bit of orthodoxy that, that's being codified is called dogma, right? Even if that doctrine existed in the history of the church, that's dogma and its opposite, which is being anathematized by the church, is the heresy. That's what ecumenical councils are for. So what people, and I, when you say, oh, okay, that's, that's basically the working definition of an ecumenical council, which it is, then people understand that, that even technically, even by definition, Vatican II is sui generis. It is one of a kind. It is the only ecumenical council that says at the beginning and the end, with with a lot of dithering in the middle, at the beginning document, beginning day, and at the end, it says this is not doctrinal in nature. Nothing announced right. here will be doctrinal in nature. It will be pastoral. So what, what is that? I mean, a council is a body to do things that are in nature doctrinal. You can't I mean, if if what you're talking about is the ways to effectuate the faith and hand them down, um, then it, it, you're talking about doctrine. Um, if you want to go to, about styles of implementing that, then that's hold a seminar or something, or uh, I, I I don't know what you you allow the individual pastors to do that in their own pastoral way, but you can't make a doctrine out of something that's inherently anti-doctrinal. It, it seems to me, you know, like when you, you talk to a, a, high, a college freshman and they, they took their philosophy 101 class and they come up at Thanksgiving and they think they know everything yeah, because they yeah. read excerpts from Nietzsche or whatever. It, yeah. It's, it's like where they say, you know, there is no truth. There is no absolute truth. There's only relativism. We talked about this yesterday with, uh, or this week with uh, Lizzie Rose and her college experience. You say there is no absolute truth. Well, that's an absolute claim. So your entire right. you, you don't believe in any absolute objective truth except for one positive sentence, which is right. There is no truth. Everything's relative. So that's the only dogmatic thing in your entire system. And then everything is relative. It mm -hmm. seems to me something similar goes on with the spirit of Vatican II, post Vatican II church. There is no capital D dogma anymore mm -hmm. in the church. We're not going to hold that, you know, Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists or even Jews need to be baptized and incorporated into sacramental life. The only capital D dogma anymore is be pastoral. And then everything else has to go th uh -huh. on the massage table like you used before and get modified, softened, you know, really kind of brought to its lowest common denominator for public consumption. So and even, and even I think you and I would argue and have spent many, many collective hours arguing, um, modified so far that it's been, been fundamentally changed in many cases into the opposite of its real meaning. Right. Certainly the case with loss. Yes. <clears throat> so that's pastoral. I mean, we've got a lot more. Do you want to, you got anything more to say on that, Tim, on pastoral? It's, I think it's probably the arch buzzword. It's the arch buzzword. Everything that we're going to talk about. Yeah, I would just, I would say it's, it's people should, should investigate, um, look into this on their own, because there's actually a, a lot on it. But I would say that it's the primary means, the primary practical means. There is some, there is some bad philosophy out there that helped nominalism and relativism steal into the church. But it's it's the primary way in the past century that relativism stole into the church. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, it, I, I, it's a big concept. Often priests will, will say, well, that's, that's the doctrine. Doctrine is A, right? Pastorally, it's, it's essentially what they're telling you is it's inappropriate to ever announce the truth. A, whatever it is, whatever the given truth right. is. It could be not pastoral. It's, it's, it's fundamental. What they'll say is it's, it's by its nature, categorically non-pastoral. So you never announce that truth. And then you're like, well, what do I say other than the truth when this topic gets brought up? Contraception. Like, because this is one of the big issues. They're like, it's non-pastoral to tell all of, all of your congregation that what they're doing wildly in the sixties and seventies is a mortal sin. You're like, well, what the hell else do I do, bro? You know, I mean, like, what do you want from me? And they're like, that's, did you get the memo? Because that's what we wanted to talk to you about. So what's more pastoral than telling your entire congregation who's all got like, you know, the average family size is 1.2 in this, you know, in the richest congregation in most suburban cities across America is it's more pastoral to tell them to contracept is ultimately what they're saying. So you end up sneaking right. in. It's no, it's always doctrine on the books. This is where we're going. This is why we couldn't yeah. just, this end is, this is where we get to Pope Francis, the doctrines on the books, but on the books, but in reality, you get a, you get a theory, reality, false dichotomy, which liberals love. It comes from outside the church and they'll say in reality, contraception is the pastoral way that we relate to them. It's like, but that's illegal. And they're like, on the books, it is. It's a, it's a, remember Augustine talks about, um, um, de dicto versus de facto a lot. And this is, this is a de dicto, de facto false dichotomy. They literally will say, yes, we'll leave it on the books forever. We could never contradict the word of God. They're like, yeah. cool. Or the so doctrine of the church. Them. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Then I'm gonna go yeah, tell them, and they're like, "Well, no, 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 yo, no." You, you got to watch your tone. Then you're like, "Okay, I'll tell them nicely that they're going to hell if they contracept until the day they die." <laughs> However, you say that <laughs> nicely, right. like, no. But even if you tell them pastorally, uh, oops, I mean nicely, it's non-pastoral to ever announce the truth. That's yeah. what they're doing, people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, if if we're gonna get if we're gonna get suicided, it, it might be for this show because it, it it's the main way they it work. It isn't that the last 50 years in the Catholic church, right up into the, the situation with McCarrick and with Vigano and this yes. in Covington boys and uh, Cardinal Dolan uh-huh. and right. Cuomo. All of this is about not delivering the truth. Oh, James Martin. Well, yes, in yep. the catechism, it does say that. Right. But in our ministries, we don't say that because it's not pastoral. Right. Homosexuality is one of the sins that cries out right. for vengeance in, in the cat, in the Roman Catholic Judeo Christian tradition. Yes, that's right. But you never say that. Yeah. And it's like, no, no, we actually have a two. We, we now have two tier Catholicism. That's what it is. It's two tier Catholicism. I, it. So we've got, we've got upstairs in the attic. We have all the documents that's that have all the truth on it. And then downstairs in the right. kitchen, you never bring up what's up, what was established back in the day up in the attic. You never That's open it. those boxes, right? Down in yes. the kitchen, we just give hugs and serve biscuits and honey. Right. And right. that's, and that's, that's the two tier Catholicism. And then there are people in the church who are like, Hey, I was up in the attic and uh, kind of like in um, Christmas vacation when he's like locked up in the attic yeah. and he finds yeah. the old, uh, the videos films. Yeah. yeah. And he's has the funny, funny uh, coats on and all that. Mm-hmm. It's like someone went up in the attic and they found all these boxes and started opening like, Oh my gosh, look at all this stuff. Like catechism of the council of Trent, you know, yeah. second yeah. Nicene council. Right. Yeah. And they're reading right. all this stuff and they come back downstairs. Like, you're not going to believe what I just read upstairs. And like, shh, don't talk about that. It's not pastoral. It's not pastoral. Or yeah. you, you trad. Right. You trad. For, for, trad for saying, well, there's no such thing as a trad. Trads out there who, who are proud of it. They, I, it's, Taylor and I say this all the time. If you're proud of the fact that you're a truth speaker and that you talk about doctrine rather than what's pastoral, and you actually like 
their term. This is like using Marx's epithet capitalist and being proud of it. It's like, no, 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 I'm free enterprise, baby. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, free by, market by, free enterprise. By self-identifying as capital T trad, and I use the word sometimes just as so a colloquial, I. but you're basically giving legitimacy to false dichotomy. the people down the kitchen. Yes. Two-tier Catholicism is, see, that's that's what we needed to get to before yeah. we could move on. That That's a great, a great okay, way so, for people so to So the next term... The next term is dialogue. So whenever, whenever there is a, a dissonance or there's a problem, so someone says, it says this in the catechism, what are we going to do? We're going to dialogue, mm-hmm. which, means, dialogue which means, once again, we're going to do absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. Oh, it usually means... And again, when we were talking about this before we rolled tape, we were like, well, some of these words are in one category where they're pure BS and pure <laughs> like either neologism that's yeah. just made up yeah. the way that they use words in like, like faith experience. Fahrenheit 450. Yeah, faith, yeah, like, we're like, going to get to faith experience in a little bit. But those are the kind or, of words like faith or experience. social justice. Yes. Or it's just faith experience and social justice are just only a, a person with an IQ of less than 90 finds this word intellectually right. satisfying. But um, and they're totally made up and pastoral was basically totally made up. But now when you get to dialogue, we're not saying that the concept of dialogue doesn't exist, even in a robust way in Western civilization. That's what Plato's dialogues are called. They're called dialogues because there's always Socrates with some sophist uh, of Athens doing doing dialogue and it's real dialogues. So we're not saying dialogue is faith, uh, fake. You get, let's just, let's just, we're eliminate. doing dialogue right now. This technically we are, we are it, dialoguing it two, two logoses, but uh, hammering it out. But they, they think of dialogue more as, uh, Hegel. We yes. have two people who, who fundamentally disagree. And if we, we hang out a lot and exchange gifts and take pictures together and issue some documents together, over time, both of our views will sort of gel together and create this new awesome thing. What they mean by dialogue is if you build enough gingerbread houses together at a contest. That's right. And have a guy somehow... and you have to have a guy with a wig that's judging it <laughs> with all your bros together on a Friday night. Then you will somehow be able to make contraception OK, that, because that's what right. it is. It's making. It's making two parallel lines meet somewhere in eternity. Mm-hmm. But they can never meet right. by uh, basically by giving in. It's, it's the same thing, really, as pastoral. You're going to make the doctrine fold before the right. anti-doctrine yeah. by dialoguing it. So it's not even strictly Hegelian. When he, some, some fan of TNT asked, he asked very curtly, and then he apologized for being curt. Why do you have Hegel on your shelf? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just said for reading. Um, and then he was like, oh, and I was like, no, I mean, Hegel's Hegel's not good stuff. But it's Isn't that funny. Very, we get so many important. comments. I used to like work I, comments about what's in the back of the round of the picture. I had, yeah, yeah, I had yeah. a pair of staghorns. And they're like, you're Illuminati. Staghorns <laughs> are Illuminati. I'm like, no, they're staghorns. You, yeah, I'm not saying you're not Illuminati, uh, but <laughs> maybe but Illuminati. But, didn't. Yeah. yeah, right. Uh, no, but so it, Hegel is at least more, a, a little more fair in that he says the basic Hegelian position. You don't have to waste a year of your life studying Hegel. This is what it is. It's please, basically please don't. a thesis, inter, you know, at the beginning of a dialogue, a thesis interacts with its opposite antithesis. They go together. And instead of the typical Western thing that we get out of Greek philosophy of one wins out one position, the lights are on in the room or they're off in the room. You're wrong if you say they're off in this room right now, even though I'm a little dimmer than usual in here. Uh, Hegel says there's some some uh, it's called the Aufhebung, where out of that that oppositional force, there's a third position of a and it's called a synthesis. Right. Or it's position negation, higher third position, which is which synthesizes right. a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. So it's. They kind of like the yeah. concept. Libs love it because oh, they love no it. Both wrong. compromise. Both, Both have to compromise. compromise and come together. 
and ontologically, their answer isn't just pastoral. It's got real ontological status, that yeah. higher third. Yeah, it's like so husband it's, says, let's watch Rambo, and wife says, let's watch Sleepless in Seattle. And so you end up sitting on the couch and watching, I don't know, what would be the, what would be the Hegelian synthesis of that controversy a chick, right there? A chicken heels with an AK-47. Like, it's, it's Anne to- Barnhart. Tomb Raider. Anne Barnhart, Tomb Raider 3. Yeah. Right, exactly. Uh, um, yeah, so that's at least Hegel, who's not a committed leftist. He's he's complicated. He, he's garbage, but he's not a committed leftist. The committed yeah, leftist. Yeah, I'd, left, I'd put him left. Well, there's left Hegelians and right Hegelians. Yeah, they're, all, they're all to the left of me. They're all to the left of me, but then again, <laughs> so is everyone. I, I look at, yeah, I mean, seriously. Um, but that's not what the left wants to do in the church, to be fair. That's all I'm pointing out. The left wants to dialogue not to give 50% share to losing leftist ideas. All leftist ideas are losing. Uh, they're losing ideas for losers, by and for losers. Um, and they don't win on the ideas. You know that. People, leftists are not interested in debate the way conservative kids want to debate them. Maybe right. you've noticed they're interested in shutting you up, taking your rights, yelling over yelling you. at you. And, and forcibly eventually throwing you in concentration camps. But that's for another show. But it's really true. I'm not exaggerating. That's 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 yeah. what the left wants to do. Yeah, go the watch the Covington clips. There you go. That's it. But th- so they don't. They're not interested in a debate on these things, th- which would be like 50-50 share, which I think arguably is what Hegel actually wanted to do. He wanted to say there are no opposites. He's right. at work on a kind of different project. They actually want to just give take a 100 percent wrong spirit of Vatican II liberal idea and make it right by right. dialoguing and they won't through the process of dialogue make you forget what, yes. what's what's going on. Yeah. yeah, James Martin doesn't want to say, well, we can somehow get sodomy as a sin that cries to heaven and you can marry your boyfriend at the altar in, the, in my church. That somehow we're going to get both of those to compromise. He no. really just wants the latter. Yes. Hundred percent. Yeah. So we've done pastoral. We've done dialogue. This third wow. one, Tim and I, we've talked about this since maybe I don't know six videos. This is a recurring theme for us: social justice. So we don't have to spend too much time on that. All justice is social. It's what you owe to another. Therefore, it must be social. It must require two persons, and it could require God, the Trinity. Mm-hmm the three divine persons, what you owe to God, so that's justice, or what you owe to your neighbor. So all justice is social. People just say social justice or social justice doctrine so they can kind of crowbar in that word social and then get social programs and then get socialism, and then they're off to the races. People will ask you, though, here, I'll I'll be the, the people asking you give the answer. Okay. Do you think this really works, though? Like, does is is does this operate on the average, you know, IQ hundred person? Does it actually work to start indoctrinating someone to socialism, socialism or socialistic ideas, just by crowbarring in the word social? And the answer the answer is yes. It why, is why absolutely is yes. Well, I've heard why from so many young Catholics, and they'll say, "Yeah, you know, I've always voted pro life, and." You know, I definitely, you know, believe the historic teaching in the church, but I've been really getting into social justice lately. Mm -hmm. Or I've been studying some of the more social justice saints. Mm -hmm. And then you begin talking with them and their language is Marxist. It's redistribution of wealth. It's covetousness between the classes. Right. And you're off to the races. Uh, Right. If you're a Thomist like us. You just speak of the virtue of justice. Right. If you want to give it a capital J, great. You're good. You don't need to say social justice. It's like you it's like you were saying, uh, I think in a previous one, ATM machine. Well, ATM means automatic teller machine. Is that what ATM means? Yeah. yeah. So if you say yeah. ATM machine and it's you've already said the machine by saying the M. It's redundant. Automatic teller machine machine. Right. It doesn't yeah. make any sense. Yeah. Right. That's the same thing with social justice. There can be no justice with just a person. There has to be. Yeah, sorry. There has to be another person for there to be justice. 
It's always or, social. The there's there's a, a harmlessness and a, an accidentality that you see like when you use ATM, you're using it as adjectivally. So right. there's naturally a want that, that arises on the part of the speaker to say, well, I just use an adjectival. I want to use a noun after it. So you say ATM machine. I get why that happens. Sure. The same thing does not happen grammatically where even someone with decent grammar wants to make that mistake or inclines to make that mistake. The same thing does not happen with social justice, right? Because when right. you say justice, it's already nominal. It's already a noun. Yes. Um, something that's already nominal in nature doesn't require another noun or it doesn't require the adjectival. So right. it, it doesn't work both ways. Nouns are greater than adjectives. And when you're already using a noun like justice that includes a subset of adjectives, um, right. so, socialness. It's uh, not oh, concerning more than one is already built into the now. So you don't need yeah. it. It's, the reason that, yeah, there's never been a time in history where someone said, um, you know, let's talk about justice. And they're like, okay, well, do you mean the social kind or the non-social kind? I just, right. can, can you, you clarify that? For, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Aristotle teaches from Plato that you cannot work. Uh, you can't willfully work injustice upon yourself. It's impossible. Um, well, so we, so, would, as Christians, would say we could by virtue of our relationship to God. Sure. So, sure, like, if you were by yourself and uh, looked at pornography, you know, did, did a mortal sin, you're solitary. So the secularist would be like, well, that's not unjust because you're by yourself in your bedroom. But the, right. the Catholic would say, well, no, there is an injustice because God is present. Right. Yeah. There's, there's this whole, there's this whole You're singing subset against God. Of, of book five in the ethics where he talks about, well, there's justice in the general sense, there's justice in the particular sense. Just in the particular sense is always social. Um, and he's, he doesn't have, you know, Aris, uh, as always, Thomas sees farther than Aristotle corrects a little bit. But he says, but you could work in injustice in the general sense just by doing something that's unlawful and, and looking right. at pornography for Aristotle or Thomas. Maybe not Thomas. He's a little more libertarian. Would be unlawful because it's just not the right thing to do. So it would be unjust in that way, right. at, at the very least. And even the that last, breaks down because you could say, well, the woman depicted in it is part of a social abuse. That's right. Well, so, that's right. I mean, that's right. Yeah. yeah. It is. It's, but, but, you can't really think of a way where justice is an individuated, solitary event. It has to be social. It always involves bad things happening that in, involve other people. It's, it's really difficult to do. I always challenge my students to right. try because they're always interested in trying. It's this, all of right. us who have a libertarian streak in them, uh, including yours truly, when, when you're younger and you haven't thought about it as much, you're like, no, 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 I want to find a situation where you're doing wrong. Because sin is always public in nature. That's, that's what Thomas adds that Aristotle might not get. But even Aristotle agreed that basically it's always that that vice is always public. He just didn't call it sin. Um, it's got an inherently public nature. Libertarians who even right wingers want to find, well, there are two distinct classes of sins. This is public. This violates the enlightenment harm principle, you know, by mill. Um, this sin of, of whatever pornography, self abuse, that's utterly private. I'm not saying it's okay, but it, it, you throw it in a different wan light when you do that. It's just, it's, it's all got a public component yeah. because of the nature to God and the body of Christ, because sure. we're all part of the body of Christ. When you harm yourself with sin, uh, it, it's, it's bad. What's, what's bad for the goose is bad for the gander to That's right. reverse the old expression. But what I was saying is frog boiling really works, right? Which is what the left is always uh, mm -hmm. afoot with. They're always boiling frogs to take away our rights to, right. to really enslave us. And um, and they are masters after Foucault and Derrida. They really became masters of post-structuralism and deconstruction. That, that That's a linguistic thing. That's why they're always, always, always wordsmithing stuff. They're, they're right. really clever. Because they're gotta, nominalists. All there are are nomen. Right. Names. All there are are names. And so if you don't believe in reality, you don't believe in forms, you don't believe in final causality, you're not a Thomist, you're not a Catholic. Definitions. Right, yeah. Right. And you don't believe those definitions are real. They're just name tags that are placed on things. 
Well, then you have to become a master at tagging things for power. Right. Now we get into Nietzsche. Right. So, yeah, all these deconstructionists, they're busy in their academies figuring out how to use words, wordsmithing, in order to gain power. But perfect example. Uh, we, we don't talk about this a ton on our show, but in the 1970s, the progressive left was saying that that capitalism is ruining the environment through global cooling. Then um, in the late 80s, it, it shifted to global warming, the opposite. And then around 2002, 2003, uh, they, the Earth magazine, uh, left-leaning science journal, reported that according to ice caps, the global average is cooling again. So then they shifted to, okay, it's not warming or cooling. It is uh, uh, climate change, right? So they don't use global thermo anymore is what right. I always called to make fun of it. They don't use global warming. It's climate change. So it's always changing. They never, ever, ever apologize or take back or say, look, we are wrong in the right. 70s. We are wrong in the late 80s yeah. about the two opposites. One of them has to be wrong, right? That's the Hegelian thing. No. Nope. Global, global uh, climate, climate change is the thing. So they're masters of the, what drives the narrative. Global warming shows what they're up to better than I think any other one thing, which mm -hmm. is like, because it's the Hegelianism. The narrative always goes forward, even when contrafactual facts present themselves. They, they didn't miss a beat. They just and and the and I'm I'm sorry to say it, but the the ninety percent, ninety to ninety five percent, the useful idiots just they don't they don't catch it. They don't catch it. They march they march right along like they goose step right along. Wait, you were calling it global warming a while ago. Now you're telling me yeah. for the last fifteen years the globe's actually been cooling by most yeah. measures. Yes, um, but they don't even they don't even ask why are you calling it climate change? It was a total paradigm shift, and it took a couple years, it was like oh yeah. six oh seven oh eight. When I got back from Italy, climate change had begun. It's because they were reacting to that data from oh two oh three, um, and they just the narrative drives the facts rather than the facts drive the That's narrative. Right. This is what's afoot with with justice, uh, social justice, right? If you if you boil. If you cook up the language enough, you can boil the frog. You do it That's slowly. Right. You got to go slow. And, yeah, you use the nomen to, which have vague definitions because we're not nominalists, and they seem to even acknowledge this by what they're doing. Their their linguistic witchcraft, their linguistic alchemy. They know that the names have hoary definitions that kind of change, but are kind of fixed, and so they'll use the definition that sounds innocuous. Um, they'll advert to a noun or a word that sounds innocuous, like social justice. But they know if you say that word social enough time, it's whatever it is, two thirds of the letters of socialism. And then if they inject, inject two thirds of the definition of socialism into the, the word they're using social justice, That's right. they've got you two thirds pro socialism, That's which right. is the average even right wing Catholic. Uh, or even talking about Alistair McIntyre or G.K. Chesterton. They're two-thirds right. of a socialist. That's right. Sorry. Sorry to say it. And when they, when they say, I'm really getting into social justice theology, they don't mean I've been reading the second part of the second part of the Summa Theologiae. Not usually. No. Right. They, <laughs> no. The, you know, the, they're not talking about justice, qua justice. They're talking about something in the last 50 years every time. Which brings us, what you were just saying, to another catchphrase, and that is springtime of evangelization. This is kind of like climate change. We mm -hmm. have been told for 50 years we are on the cusp or we are in the springtime of evangelization. And yet, mass attendance, these are objective facts. This is not me making up stuff. Mass attendance, down. Polling people on belief of Real presence. Real presence and transubstantiation, way down. Infant baptisms, down. Confirmations, down. Weddings in the church, down. Ordinations, down. Vocations to the to the uh, female religious life, way down. Gone. <laughs> Not existed. So, you know, if we were a company and we're like, well, you know, what do the numbers say? Let's look at some of our, our quantitative facts. They'd be like, we're about to go bankrupt. That's mm -hmm. what the board of trustees would hear. The mm -hmm. product is failing. 
And yet we hear over and over. And actually, you haven't really heard it since Francis. It was really a, a John Paul II, Benedict the Sixteenth catchphrase, which is yeah. springtime evangelization. So the idea is we had a winter, things died mm-hmm. off, but now the sun's coming out, the lilies are budding, mm-hmm. the bunny rabbits are jumping around. You can hear the birds again. Mm-hmm. Lent's almost over. Springtime evangelization. Uh, no. Look around, folks. It's contrafactual. It's contrafactual. Yeah, it's, I think of it, I associate it much more with JP2 than Benedict. Maybe that. Maybe that's just a subjective thing. But, man, I mean, because JP2 types really, it, it's, it's like the, the corny, sort of campy, kind of embarrassed, cheesy optimism that, that I associate with the average. I think even faithful Catholic, we're not talking about libs that just say, I just jp2 i came into the church under under jp2 and things are great it's like things aren't great bro like if you came in in the 80s or 90s under jp2 we're we're in we're in a, a abomination of desolation still and and yet they just it's so about controversial it. to say that tim what you just said like freaks people out in 2019 still people are coming around yeah but you know, when we look at how did McCarrick get to where he was, it was JP2. You know, James Grind was on this show with us. And he said in 1987, I, I told John Paul II to his face what was going on with McCarrick. And the guy goes on to be a cardinal. And we, we in another show, we looked at all the appointments that were made yep. to the College of Cardinals under the early young years of John Paul II. And there's some real sour apples in there. Yeah, I wasn't even. I'm, I'm not leaving you alone on the precipice because because you, you just went to the precipice. Yes, I, I'm there. I'm 100 percent there with you. But I and I'm, so no buts here. I was just pointing at uh, uh, the zeitgeist of a couple of decades in the church. I, I'm there with you 100 percent. But I was go, being less controversial. And there's no way to interpret the 1980s and the Roman Catholic census fidelium or the 1990s when I grew up and I know him well with the, the corny campy optimism, which is utterly baseless, right? We're, we're whistling past a graveyard. We're in the abomination of desolation. The church was uh, in auto destruct mode. Even Paul the sixth said so. And, um, and yet these, these corny sort of faithful Novus Ordo types were just, talking about how beautiful and great the springtime of, of evangelization was. For, forget the fact that, yeah, we're all kind of red-pilling on JP2 the last five years. Again, I was never fully on board that because I never trusted the corny campy. I don't trust anything corny campy over, over optimistic. But the fact of the matter is, whether or not people have yet red-pilled on the pontificate of JP2 himself, I'm talking about the epoch of JP2, the time period. 80s, 90s. 80s, 90s. You can't deny it. Yeah, 80s, 90s. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at the charts, people will say, well, you know, in the early, mid 80s, there was a bump up in some places. Uh, Okay, well, granted. I mean, John Paul II brought some life back in, you know. Uh, He brought some excitement back. Um, And he was definitely more conservative than Paul VI. Mm -hmm. All that being said, the agenda that had been set in since the mid late sixties was still going full on. And we've u- used the analogy before Tim of, you know, when they brought in the new Coke mm-hmm. and people are like, well, and they're like, what is this? And like it's new Coke. Oh. It's way better. You're going to like this way better than what we used to have in Coke. And they're like, well, we don't No, you do. It's way better. That only works. We have to look it up Tim, cause we use it so often. I mean, how, how many months was new Coke it's a good question. in the stores? We need to find out, how long did it take them to just say, okay, we're going to Coke classic. And for years it said Coke classic on the bottle. Coca-Cola classic. It was, I remember that even growing up. I don't know when new Coke came out, but I remember, I think into the nineties, it was called Coca-Cola classic. Classic. Just just like, we're, we're not tricking you. It's the original thing. Just because people were ticked about it. And we've now been 50 years where they're like, trust us. New Coke is way better. And like, I'm still not convinced. The, the the sad statement is that I think this is this is me getting psychological, but but I think it's undeniable. 
The sad statement is when you tweak or adjust or when you're a leftist, tweaking, adjusting, pontificating to the American people or the American Catholic census of Delian about something that's gustatory, right? That's, that's by its nature, it has to do with food or drink. We Americans don't take crap from anybody, right? And we like to say, oh, we're Americans, don't mess with us, 1776, bro, don't step, all this. But we're, we're, we're a soft, complacent people now, right, that, that wouldn't, you know, the 1776 American colonists would not have stood for any of the garbage we stood for now. These people had a revolution because someone put a minor tariff on their breakfast beverage, as Dennis Miller used to say. We, we have an income tax, you know, this is... This is the heart of tyranny, and, and we took that on the chin 100 years ago, and now we've proven that we won't have a revolution no matter how many rights you take. So we have, are feckless. The American conservative, my, all my life, has plagued me, is feckless. The only thing, however, that, that Americans are in the, the analogy Catholics won't stand for is something like if you actually mess with our sh- sweet, sugary, carbonated yeah. beverage and you give us a crappy version— New Coke, we will not stand for. We demand Coca-Cola Classic. Well, but, but, here, but liturgically, where it actually matters, we will take New Coke all day long. No, we I don't think so. There's, there's, there's millions Classic. of people who are like, I hate the Novus Ordo. But I'm talking about the popular mind. No. Okay, yeah. But there's, the but there's, there's a, there's a major about, demographic of people who go to church every Sunday and they're like, I wish I didn't have to go through this again every Sunday. Well, well of course, like you. I'm one of them. But I'm, oh, I I'm just saying, looked it up, Tim. I'm guess how long? Ninety-five percent. Guess how long? Yeah, it took for Coke, Coca-Cola, I'm gonna to reverse. How long? Seventy-eight days. Seventy-eight days. That's. I thought it the was back, there for like a year. Well, they kept wow. it on, so they 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 kept their new Coke, and then after seventy-eight days, they're like, we made a mistake. We're gonna go and have Coke Classic, and they sold them side by side. But then eventually, no one bought. New Coke, and so they just discontinued it. That's what I just read. So it's less se- than three months. Wow. So, but see, this is what. But a, see, these are businessmen. They pre- want money in their bank account, and they're right. saying so to themselves, "There's the a major backlash. Our brand is damaged. Our stock's going down. We're not going to get Christmas bonuses. I can't buy that second house. Let's change it back." That's right. what they which think. Is, which is why I will always against these distributist types these a lot of trads have, have embraced this this uh, basically socialism through distributism I'll always defend free enterprise because of the invisible hand it will always locate the truest version of something um, for, for something that's gustatory in nature a flavor or a taste the popular voice the Vox Populi is trustworthy and people tend to insist on it. There's no such thing as a Catholic springtime that uh, forces actual new Coke to somehow be popularly seen as better than Coca-Cola Classic. But so look, look at work, 78 days, people will probably mess with an American's uh, sweet, sugary, carbonated beverage, and they will be rioting in the streets, setting <laughs> stuff on yeah. fire, setting I think cars it, on fire. It, it looks like it all went down in uh, 85, so mid 80s, 1985. Oh, it was that late? Yeah, I didn't know it was that late. See, I mean, I was I was just a, a tot then. Right. But uh, but the point is, there was not a seventy-eight day tire fire, you know, happening right. with, with revolts breaking out in the street like there was for for New Coke over the Novus Ordo, the, the you know the closest thing to heaven on earth. No, the, there the, were there the were riots. Liturgy. There were people ticked. They just got squashed. But they were a minority. If True. there was, there if it was a majority, then this would not. We would not yeah. be where most we're of at. that generation. And you're always, you're always throwing rocks at the baby boomers. But always, <laughs> always. But the baby boomers, they generally kind of liked it. They embraced it. Still, it's still a minority. It's a growing right. minority. And by, I always defend the correct minority because the masses are almost always wrong aside from things about what's sugariest and best they get they get by you know affairs of the stomach right but everything else the masses get wrong and so i'm not i'm not saying that the masses are right i'm just saying that unlike well it'll correct Coke, over time because Coke, we're seeing people 
who are just saying, I'm not, I'm not going to church anymore. I saw a study that said right. something but that it's been 50 years. That's all I'm saying. It's, it's not true. 78 days. Yeah. If, but this is not just a beverage. This is an entire worldview, a way of life, a liturgy. No, I know, but, but the analogy, the analogy breaks down unless you say, look, 78 days for the leaders to say this was a failure. Why is it 50 years? However, that is 50 times 365. That's much more than 78 days without them saying everyone quit going to mass, whatever, because there's an agenda driving it. The right. Novus Ordo. That's, that's, right. that's all I'm saying. Because they people don't haven't. Yeah, the Pope doesn't and the cardinals and everyone, the liturgists, they don't care if the numbers are going down. They're not CEOs. They're not on the board. But, they don't care. But, the entire nature nature of pastoral, the uh-huh. pastoral liturgy, the Novus Ordo, that's supposedly the more pastoral one, is less pastoral. I know. And they don't care of they don't even care. using their own pastoral no. springtime that's of the That's because pastoral means popular. do nothing. Liberal. Yeah. It means, li- it means the liberal thing that they want. They're not even paying attention to the pastoral numbers. Right. Pastor, if you return to the Latin Mass, a bunch of people would go back to Mass. I would never deny that. Yes. I'm just saying it proves the agenda when you put all of these terms together. Actually, this is this is very effective. You put the sum total of these terms together, it proves exactly that there's an agenda. Yeah. It's anti-pastoral to do the Novus Ordo. It drove people away. It's it's less good, and yet they don't care, unlike Coca-Cola executives. Right. Okay. <laughs> We've got a lot of terms to go through here, but we're, we it's do. good. So um, I'm just going to throw out a pair here. Encounter and accompaniment. Anytime I hear these two words, I want to run away. Me too. I think of Francis. I think like, of, of those, Francis. those two yeah. for sure. Yeah. If it says encounter in it, I don't want to do it. Right. It's, it's a gingerbread <laughs> type thing. Yeah. And if it's for accompaniment... Sure. It means you're doing something bad. We don't want to tell you, but we still want to hang out with you. Right. And and, and secret, affirm you. Affirm you. It means secretly <laughs> affirm you. Like accompaniment <laughs> means like you hang out with someone as they do heroin, like those old documentarians right. on and you buy them in clean the 90s. And you buy them clean needles. And you buy them clean needles. Yeah. And then secretly when you're off screen, these liberal prelates are like, heroin's cool. You should keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's really what it means. But you don't show that. Right. Yeah, I just uh, accompaniment, encounter, I'm not doing it. Jesus, Jesus, by the way, did not accompany the, the prostitutes and the tax collectors. He gave them a one time shot. He said, I'll eat dinner with you once, but go and sin no more. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, go and sin no condition. more. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, he's not accompanying them in their sin. I mean, he went with them the one time he would not have gone back if they continued sinning. Yeah. It's implied. Yeah. That's that's called Catholicism. Christ is always ready to be there for us. But if we reject him, he says, I never knew you depart into the outer darkness. Right. That's Matthew. That's the gospel. That's the word of God. I mean, we have to believe in that. And it's not continuing to accompany down the dark road of sin. Right. I don't do that with my kids. Don't do that, yeah. but I'll walk with you while you do it. No. And this is why we have this problem of why can't we ever excommunicate anyone anymore? Because it it's against exactly accompaniment. Right. And accompaniment's in the new dogma. Mm-hmm. That's right. There's a close... Excommunication is actually the antonym to <laughs> company, uh, company yeah. and it's how the church, it's how the old Coke work. The new Coke says no more excommunication. Now right. we will just accompany someone in, in, and dialogue and, along the way. Yeah. And dialogue. And so, I mean, we really are getting to the heart of it. These all are the same different facets of the same working pieces. Yes. They absolutely, these terms stand for what used to be talked about as we need to do a show on cooperation, formal cooperation mm. in sin, meaning when you actually enable someone with the goal of aiding them in sinning, like going to your third cousin's gay wedding, yeah. right? That, that is formal cooperation because you're in yeah. their sin. Or driving your roommate yours. to Planned Parenthood to get an abortion. Right. 
No bueno. Right. No, so it's no bueno, and that's what accompaniment means in the old Coke. It just means, oh, formal cooperation. You know that right. formal cooperation and mortal sin is mortal sin itself. You take it on your yourself. That's why you can't go to gay weddings or, or drive murder murder moms to murder the, their kids, mm -hmm. people. Can't do it. It's bad. So we don't need to say anything more about that. Next no. one. We were talking about this early this week, Tim, and I'm a little embarrassed to say I just now learned about this when I just figured it out. People of God. People of God, I've always thought was the Catholic Church. But I learned recently that if you go back into Hans Kuhn and, you know, like the early Ratzinger, these early theologians, Schilbecks, they are using people of God to include the Catholic Church and then all other people who are probably saved. Right. Through an ambiguous, right. uh, imp highly implied baptism by desire. So, right. So when you talk to people in the ecumenical movement, all Jews, almost all Muslims, except for those like 1% who are mean terrorist people who blow up stuff. Mm -hmm. And most Buddhists and even really good atheists. Right. They are the people of God. Right. So this is a new way. This is a way of introducing a new ecclesiology without changing the Catholic Church. So you say, right. well, this is the Catholic Church. Everybody knows this is the Catholic Church, the sacraments and all that. And we used to always talk about the, sacra uh, the, the Catholic Church as the means of salvation, the body of Christ. Soul right. mean. I was saying. Yeah, the soul mean. Nolo, yeah. nolo salus. That's right. Ecclesia. No yeah. salvation outside the church. By the way, we here at TNT embrace that. There is no salvation Catholic. outside yeah. the Catholic Church. It is Catholic dogma. You have it's to believe it. It's on, it's on the books. It's up so in the attic. Say, if you go up yeah, in the attic and the open attic. the boxes, it's in the it's in there. Yeah. You have to believe that. But and so it's kind of like, well, it's on the books. How do we get around it? Well, let's not talk about salvation through the Catholic Church. Let's talk about the people of God. And the people yeah. of God, so it's like a Venn diagram. You got Catholic Church, and then around that you have people of God. And that's everyone who's Catholic, everyone who's Protestant, everyone who's Jewish, everyone who's Muslim, minus mean people who blow up other people. And or judge, those who judge. We, we should right, talk about right, judge, too, yeah. but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, judge is another one. Uh, and then, you know, Buddhist, and then even, you know, like really cool atheist people that we like to do interviews with in European newspapers. All those people right. are the... Scoffari. Yes, all those people are the capital P people of God. And once I realized that, once I was like, oh, that makes total sense. Every time I hear that term, it's in that context. Of course. Yeah. I was, yeah. An SSPX friend told me that eight years ago about the people of God thing. And I looked it up and Man, I found, I'm found so it embarrassed. I just, up. I just got red pilled on that like a week ago. It's, it's, <laughs> it's got that feel though, right? Yeah. That it, it's, I it's always, rare. I always knew I didn't like it. Well, I was like, we have a people of God. We're baptized. We're the people of God. Okay, I get it. But now I realize that it was it, there was more baggage in that term. Yeah, it's just a way of saying, or it's like when they'll say, you know, even the term church, obviously ecclesia, is is not a a buzzword, but the way in out of the mouth of a left out of a Jacobin leftist, even the term we could church, say Jesuit, mean, yeah, Jesuit type. The, it, they mean non-visible church, right? We mean visible church. I don't know. I, I, I think they still identify Catholic church with the Catholic church. Generally. Yeah, they say that, that pro, they, the push and Ratzinger had to address this as, uh, as CDF and again as Pope. He said, you cannot call, he, remember the right. CDF issued a statement saying you cannot call Protestant congregations church. That's right. To be church, you have to have an apostolic lineage, you have to have the sacraments. You could call them congregations. They are Christian because they have a, a Trinitarian baptism. But you cannot call the, uh, the Protestant congregations church. You could call Eastern Orthodox church out of, you know, in, in imperfect communion with Rome because they have validly ordained bishops and priests and sacraments. But really, so that, that should be as far as we're willing to extend the term people of God, right? Is, is church, you know, in terms of the visible church, 
you know, the people of God are these people. And right. I'm sorry that even you could argue about whether or not to include Protestants, but I say no. You know, I say it's it's someone that's inside the church. Why talk about yeah. a Christian, yes, who accepts Jesus and the Holy Spirit as part of the Godhead, but who lack the means of satirological yeah. uh, winning, right? Yeah, you, yeah. and, and, and the, the means, Protestant will say, I am not inside the Catholic Church. They say that. They're not, <laughs> they're not claiming it. So we just take them at their word. Yeah, we're not red billing anyone here. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're just taking them at their word. This I mean, goes this back to the. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just saying the difference between 1054, uh, Great Schism. Oh, and by the way, I got a hold on. I want to inter- I got a new mug. So one of our uh, people in our audience sent this to me. This was from uh, Lyndon and Kyla Prady. Yeah, you can't really see it, can you? You can't. Yeah, I can. A little. It's just a little. Glare. It says it going. Dope. It says going with the flow since 1439. In the flow, huh. if you can read it, let's see. I need to back it up for the camera. The flow is Florence. No, no it's Florence. Oh, Florence. It's the Council you of Florence. Florence. You, yes. So this yes. is this is a Byzantine Eastern Catholic joke mug. As yes. soon as I open out of the box, I totally got it. So it's going with the flow, rents going with the Florence, and then it says since fourteen thirty nine. So Do you know that at the at I love total this. Aside, so the, Lyndon and mug. Kyla. Prady, thanks for sending me this mug. I'm adding it to the, the rotation. At the Union of Florence, they we actually temporarily undid the Great Schism. Oh, yeah. Did you know that? The entire yeah, East was, was was reunited with the Catholic with Church. The it's for, called for it's called yeah, going with the they, flow. That's cool. The East went they with the flow. That. Yeah. Yeah, they, they got really, really mad. And that was because uh Muslims had surrounded Constantinople and they they needed troops. They wanted uh the Eastern Emperor asked the Pope to announce a new crusade and, and get the Muslims around uh, from around Constantinople. And they came to an agreement. They undid Filioque. I know. I, I'd forgotten about this till I got to this chapter in church history. But then the Eastern, you know, Orthodox people, uh, I'll call them sellouts, the Eastern Orthodox the people. Uh, prelates. The when people they, when of they God. <laughs> the people, the people of God went just nuts. Kidding. Yeah, just kidding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, Wait, man. what was I saying, though, before? I was there, right? Oh, you are saying that the lay people rejected really... it. Yeah, I know, before the Florence mug, though. Oh, oh man, I'm sorry I interrupted you because I had to. No, no, no. It's, it I'm, was exci- just really... I'm excited about the mug. Well, we, were talking about, mug. No, we were talking about people of God, and we were talking about. Um... Like, jeez. Yeah. Darn it. Yeah, because it was. Uh... Your deep thought. <laughs> yeah, it was a deep thought. It was, it was getting unpacked, like. I get those all the time. Why? You're like you're like Trust going on a you're going on a on a riff, and I'm like, oh, that's I'm gonna say this next. It's so awesome. And then two minutes later, when you're like, yeah, and then you like take a breath, and it's my turn. I'm like, dang it, what was that cool thing I was just about well, to say? Well, yeah, so <laughs> I gotta start writing them down. Uh, yeah, you know, I gotta have. I, I usually keep pen and paper here for when uh, you're chatting. But the thing is, when you go back and edit it, you'll see what I was talking about. It would be super easy to. Yeah. When this happens in a non-recorded conversation, you're just out of luck. Exactly. But uh, when it happens here, what, what was it? I don't know. It's lost. Yeah, I, I guess so. Until well, let's I move on to a couple others because we, I mean, we've been going for an hour here almost, and and we are not even halfway through with our words because we're unpacking right. them for all of right. their falsities. Okay, so I like these two right here: faith experience and faith community. What the heck is yeah. that? It's garbage. Yeah, they're like, <laughs> we're going to have our youth come up and talk about their faith experience. Uh, you just made up a word. That's not Catholic. It's not in the Bible. Faith experience? Yeah. What does that mean? Is it like testimony? I don't know. I yeah, just, I think they mean. I think it, it yeah, it's, it's garbage is what it is. But it means, <laughs> no. And it's, it's faith community. Faith Why not say community? church, parish? You see these churches, yeah. the church near me, it's, you know, such and such. Catholic community, not church, not parish. It's a community. Right. Right. When did we start doing that? I think it was the eighties that churches yeah, started calling be- themselves communities. I mean, yeah. it's not the YMCA. <laughs> right. yeah. It's the temple with an altar inside of it where the, where the eternal sacrifice of the logos to the father is presented. That's what I thought that place was. Well, it's kind of playing both sides of the, it's, it's like what, what we were talking about before. 
where we're, we're kind of pulling in some, some, half the liberals are like, we'll focus on pulling the Protestant congregations, which are, that's what I was talking about, the CDF. Protestant congregations, we'll start calling them churches, even though you got to have That's bishops. what you're talking. We, we got back to yeah. it. Yeah. So half of them were like, okay, we'll, we'll pull the Protestants up to being called ecclesia, even yeah. though we're not allowed to because they don't have sacraments or bishops. And then the other half of the liberals are like, okay, you work the head, we'll work the body with punches. We'll soften them up. We'll, we'll and to pull, to keep them together, this ecumeniacality, um, we will say that the, the Catholic churches are not churches. They're just faith communities. Cause that, so it's like, they're pulling us, right. They're pulling Protestants. Half of them are pulling Protestants up to the level of church. The other half of the liberals are pulling us down to the level of congregation community. Right. That's what they're doing. Right. They, they're, they're flattening they're so it smart. out. They're, they're, they're redistributing it. our goods. They are. They're taking, their taking the wealth of the Catholics, giving it to the Protestants, spreading it out. They're, they're so clever, though. And, and conservatives are so feckless. If it sounds like I'm admiring what they do with language, even just seeing it here today, I spent my life studying and loathing the, the, the leftist animal. Um, but, but you have to, you have to admire, I mean, there, there's really, it, they are just masters of working the head and working the body at the same time. And the 90% just eat it right up. They just eat it right up. It's, it's, it's new Coke that they're actually managing to sell to people. And it costs them half the cost of old Coke, which is probably why they made the change. Yep. Yep. Good. I'm glad we, we got that. You know, the other yeah. thing is, well, why is Pope Francis washing the feet of Muslim women? You know, like I looked it up in the old like 1945 missiles and you read about the stations. It used to be in Rome that the Pope would wash the feet of 12 priests. He, it yeah. was actually priests yeah. at the mandatum to signify Christ washing the feet of the apostles. That's like the ancient Roman rite. But now the Pope washes the feet of Muslim women got nothing against Muslim women, but it's a liturgical right. Yes. And the way he can do that is like, well, the people of God. <clears throat> yeah. These Muslim women are part of the people of God, people of goodwill. They're attached to the church by goodwill, by their monotheism. You know, Jesus is in the Quran. Didn't you know that, Tim? Did you right. know that? Did you know that Mary is the only woman named in the Quran and that Jesus is also respected in the Quran? No, oh, it's so deep, bro. So deep. Dude, Muslims are the people of God. That's what they do. All right, mm -hmm. here's the next word, Tim. I didn't tell you about this one yet. Prophetic. Everyone yeah. who's awesome in the Catholic Church, particularly when it comes to social justice, are all prophetic. Yeah, for sure. Not that they ever prophesied anything about the future or anything like that or communicated the word of God like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Malachi. No, but nothing like that. Prophetic. Like in John Paul II's prophetic encyclical. Yeah. He, you know why? It's because it's there, you can always make a claim about the future as long as you don't have to um, substantiate it, right? So if you're saying, just trust us, we're, we're, we're the bishops of the church or whatever, we're the, we're the prelates of the church. The church is changing and you know, in the future, this will be vindicated. The future right. will show I am right. 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 And they're like, you're like, but, but this seems like garbage. And they're like, I know it seems like garbage, <laughs> but here's the secret. It's not. It's prophetic. Trust us. It's prophetic. Yeah. 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 yeah so prophetic is like, is, is the, is the term you use to canonize either living people or people who aren't saints yet. Right. Like Bernadine was prophetic. They would say Martin, so or they would say like Martin Luther King Jr. was prophetic. But they're not yeah. using the term prophetic to mean anything like a prophet other than saying like really important social things. Yeah. But he was also a socialist and he right. cheated on his wife within a week. Yeah, but we don't, we don't yeah. talk about that, Tim. We don't talk about That's that. That's not so prophetic. Yeah. 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 We don't talk we about don't, that. We don't do that here. Yeah. So pretty much I think the word prophetic means he did a lot of cool stuff for social justice. Ergo, mm -hmm. he's prophetic. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Peace. You know? Yeah. He's a good social justice warrior. That's right. SJ Dub. Now, another one that we've covered before, seamless garment. Yeah. So this refers to the garment that Christ wore to Calvary. Uh, one tradition states that Our Lady made it for him. She wove it for him. So it was a gift from Our Lady to Our Lord. And the, the Romans didn't want to rip it. 
so they got the dice out through dice and one of them won it, won the seamless garment. But they use this to say, well, being pro-life is yes, being against abortion, but it's also about building homes in the inner city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's also about subsidized um, food stamps. It's about open borders. Mm -hmm. It's about name whatever you, whatever the, social the, agenda you want to put in. And if you don't life. accept that, you're not pro-life. You might as well be, so, right. you might as well work at Planned Parenthood. The goal is to, 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 to let everyone know that it's not no, it's to trick everyone into thinking that there is no real pro life because they'll say, under the seamless garment, you might oppose abortion and euthanasia, which makes you pro life. But did you, it, when the guy on meth came up to your car and wanted to squeeze, you know, to befoul your window with his disgusting sock and, and claim to uh, clean it, did you recoil a little bit? It's like, well, of course, that guy's disgusting. Right. I, I mean, he's on meth. He's a criminal. Like, what, did you recoil, though? Yes. They're like, so you're not pro-life. That's the goal. It's like, yeah, I recoiled because I I have good, healthy. Yeah, like I have, a, I have like that three kids and I have three kids in the back seat. Right. Yeah. Or even if it's just me. I, I mean, the guy's right. crawling with disease. He's he's a criminal. He luxuriates all day while everyone else works hard. You know, he's just inebriated 24 seven. That's not the kind of poverty that Jesus was dealing with, you know in, in, you know, Nazareth, uh, Bethlehem as he walked around Galilee. Um, but so they, they've completely transformed the doctrine into something that no one can ever, or should ever even be, no one should be that kind of pro-life because you should recoil when, uh, someone that's a dangerous criminal approaches your car, right? You yeah. ought to people, you should, if you're, yeah. if you're responsible, yeah, so so there, it's just a way of saying there is no pro life when push comes right. to shove. And if you if you do vote for Democrat or whatever country is you know the political party that is supporting abortion up until birth, if you vote that because you also believe in inner city housing, you're okay. You're because moral. you 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 just you just pointed to a different part of the seamless garment and said I'm going to support right. you support that corner. I support this corner. We're all right. pro life here. That's right. Yeah, that's 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 what what it means either that we're all pro-life here, like Taylor just said, or none of us really are. Either one is actually satisfactory to the leftists. They just don't want. Well, one major party is in a really feckless, weak way, pro-life. You know, a lot of Republican candidates don't care at all about it, but they know they have to toe the line because about half the people are genuinely pro-life. And half the people are genuinely pro infanticide, right? right. They're, they're hideous, murdering harpies. And, you know, it, again, to take this back to the, the, the real garment uh, pro-life issue, our founding fathers in 1776, people, they had a revolution because of a minor tariff, which is a very, a very tolerable, small import tax, a very minor ta- tariff on the breakfast beverage. We allow government subsidies for infanticide. That's how that's how much we'll yes. tolerate and we'll ask for more. And tolerate thirty eight percent income tax. Thirty eight percent income plus your federal what, income tax. Plus your state plus your state and local taxes. Right. But a, a, an income tax is a capitation. The constitution was erected against capitation yeah. minor capitations. Income tax is a huge one. We will take anything on the yeah. chin and not have a revolution the way republics always require the possibility option of revolution. We will never have one because conservatives, so I'm using scare quotes, people out in the verbs are fat, complacent, happy, comfortable, won't do anything. They'll, they'll tolerate any amount of tyranny before uh, having a revolution. And, and the pro-life issue proves it, right? Yeah. I mean, look what just happened in New York. So, yeah, we're yeah. not all pro-life. Only some of us are, and only some of us, an even smaller portion of that, are willing to fight for it. Yep. So, whatever. Yep, that's seamless garment. All right, here's another one. Enculturation. You've got to do enculturation all the time, or you're not really Catholic. And this is this is the thing that kind of bugs me. Like, if it's, I love Our Lady Guadalupe. I've been to her shrine twice. 
I'm all about it. But what bugs me is in the States, you'll see these Our Lady Guadalupe presentations and you'll see adult men dressed as Aztec warriors or what they think is an Aztec warrior in a loincloth running around banging drums, right? They think it's so cool. It's, it's so gay, yeah. but they think it's so cool. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, I'm like well, we're, we're here to celebrate Our Lady Guadalupe and the conversion of the Aztec people. So I get that. I mean, if it's the feast day of St. Margaret of Scotland, I don't wear a kilt to church and bring my bagpipes to celebrate my Scottish heritage. No, yeah. well, I don't. Sure, no. You know, if it's if it's uh, St. Boniface, we don't put on our later hose and, and bring beer steins to mass and process. It's so ridiculous. It's dumb, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, or, you know, sometimes you'll see in these, uh, it, it kind of goes back to John Paul II, and the Novus Order, they, there's the presentation of the gifts, which was totally made up, right? But <laughs> they people will bring it them was. up, but they will be dressed in some insane garb, <laughs> right? Yeah. That harkens to, to some ancient culture or what we think. <clears throat> like, we're not quite sure what Zulu warriors looked like in the 1600s because there's no photos, but we're pretty sure this is how they would have dressed. And so we're going to wear a Zulu warrior costume to bring up the bread and the wine. Lame people think that's so cool. They Lame love it. Dumb people think they, that's so they cool. They love it. But I hate them. In culturation, <laughs> it just, I get it that cultures, you know, are, are part of the church and every tribe, tongue, and nation. But this is a Ugh. new thing where we, we have to somehow celebrate that, which is, has nothing to do with, with Catholicism. It's so, so lame. Yeah. Yeah. That's all you have to say. I mean, that's all you have to say. It's yeah. just so lame. Right. And if you think this is cool, if you're sitting out there like, I, we're going to get some people that are like, why are they dogging this? I love the celebration of the indigenous peoples when they, at mass, they, right. they do their, their, their chants. And, oh, it's lovely. Yeah, it's their like, dance, right, the this, rain dance. And I mean, yeah, this think about this, Tim. What if we got a call? What if we got a call? And it's Pope Francis's people. Uh, and they're like, hey, we love the show. Uh, we're doing a, a world family of meetings and you have eight kids, to Marshall. We want you to bring up the gifts at the Pope's mass. And I say, OK, great. So um, just want to clear with you guys, we're from Texas. So we're going to be wearing our indigenous traditional Texas clothing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And they're like, that sounds awesome. So the Marshalls show up and I've got like the. <laughs> the, 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 I've, got, just, I've got I've got my jeans on. I've got cowboy. I got the jeans tucked inside the cowboy boots. I got spurs on because yeah. you got to have spurs on your boots. You need my enormous. I have it belt buckle yeah. with the yeah. with the Texas flag in it. Right. Uh -huh. I got the pearl button shirt, the ten gallon hat, the bolo. Yeah. Right. And then I got all my boys dressed like that. My wife's wearing a denim dress with boots yeah with the with a denim jacket you with have the toothpick and we bring up and they're like a traditional texan family like, you know like ewtn you know a, Voice, a traditional yeah. texan yeah. family offer brings up the gifts and presents them to the holy father in their indigenous garb yes <laughs> yeah. i mean it's that so would, dumb you know it's like so dumb yeah so anyway enculturation that, yeah. that would be great. I would, I would actually like to see that kind of my, my traditional garb. I'm to I'm celebrate because I need to celebrate my culture in the mass. Right. That's what, that's where you, you do. do it. You come to the holy sacrifice of Jesus Christ, eternally offered to the Father, and you in, you what you do there is you celebrate your indigenous cultures. What you do, you what? celebrate. You own it. You love it. Yeah, it's all about <laughs> us, and it's just wrong. Now, here's These another one scum. is restoration. Yeah. This is what they use, especially in liturgy. They'll say, we are restoring Holy Week. We are restoring the practice of the lay people offering the offertory in mass. We are restoring prayers of the faithful. Everything is a restoration mm -hmm. or we're restoring the offertory prayers. But when you actually read them, you're like, well, you're restoring this from which century? And they're like, right. well, we just wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Eucharistic prayer number two was a restoration of an ancient uh, prayer. And it was written on a napkin yes. in a, an Italian restaurant. Yeah. And they'll it's say, like, oh, it's the ancient prayer of Hippolytus. And you go and Google the ancient Eucharistic prayer of Hippolytus and you put Eucharistic prayer two next to it. And you're like, 
I don't even know if this would count as plagiarism. Yeah, no, or, or anywhere near it. I don't know if it would even count as borrowing from the idea. Right. It was it's made up. New. It was made up. Yeah. So they didn't restore anything. Prayers of the faithful? Yeah. No, that's not restored. So they always use, we're, we're going back to the er, how it was done in the early church. This wooden table from Ikea that's built on an angle to look modern. Ancient Christians, this is how they had mass on these modern, weird plywood tables. Mm -hmm. were, from Ikea. Yeah, from they Ikea. Always, we're restoring that. And, you know, they never want to restore anything like the Eucharistic fast from midnight till communion the next day. Right. Which goes way back east and west. Right. They don't want to restore that. That's hard. It's not pastoral. Right. Or, you, I, you know, like I once read in the early church that the men sat on one side of the church and the females sat on the other side of the church. They don't want to restore that. Yeah. Everything they restore is fake. Yeah. And it's brand new. It's a key. Hey, one, one we ha we are, are we done with restoration? There's no. one we have to do. Do it. Throw it because because we're running out here. Is active participation. This one should have. Well, so here's what I was thinking. We have so many liturgical ones we haven't got to. Tim, I was kind of thinking as we were about 45 minutes in the show, I was like maybe we just do a part two, and we do liturgy. Part two. We do liturgy yeah. because we got worship space, <laughs> presider. <laughs> I mean, yeah. there's there's a yeah. whole gathering gather in. Yeah, sending forth yeah. there's there's I, i've got a whole list of them here and I, there's no way we can finish them so i think we pause here and we come it's back falling. again and we do the same show but it's all liturgical buzzwords these are more all of right, like man. dogmatic pastoral yeah. <laughs> buzzwords yeah, they're, they're not dogmatic but they're, they're anti-dogmatic <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah right yeah, okay so that one would be part of liturgy yeah well then well, yeah we, yeah we, i mean some of the ones we, we didn't get to because i know we got to close off were mercy we didn't get mercy. to that we we call it mercy justice, like space time. As a yeah, yeah. Ecu ecumenism. Yeah. Well, that's not very I, ecumenical. No. Outreach, which doesn't mean anything. Outreach. Stewardship, which just means give us money, but it has nothing really to do with stewarding. It also means worship the environment. In True, it does mean terms that. like glad to see. Yeah. Another term we didn't get to was formation. They love to talk about formation, especially human formation. They love the human formation. Human formation. And then big. another one that, that I hear a lot is ongoing. We're having an ongoing investigation into McCarrick. Yeah. Or an ongoing a, reform. The term might as well be ongoing investigation. <laughs> and it's about, it's about some, you know, pedophile. Right. Obviously. On, yeah. So ongoing is another one. It means we're really serious about it, but there's no end in sight and not really any progress to report. We are really serious about getting to the bottom of this, but we're not going to say one word about it. Right. We're never going to think about it again. And we're not really very serious about it. Right. But there is an ongoing investigation. Yep. So those are, those are 20 words. We just did 20 words, including the ones we threw out here at the end. Uh, so if you're watching and you have other words we missed, we'll go ahead and write a comment underneath this video. Uh, well, we've got an ongoing investigation into them, so we might use right. your word if you write that's it right. in a comment in the video. And then Don't worry. At, it's ongoing. At some point, we'll do another video like this, and we'll do all uh, the liturgy buzzwords, active participation, mm -hmm. worship space. Not it's not a church, not a temple. It's a worship space. Mm -mm. So space for worshiping. That's right. So all right, we had a little fun here, but I think we got some. We ripped it off the bone. We got some meat. Uh, yeah. Again, if you're if you're getting us through Google Plus, doesn't work anymore. It's broken. YouTube chopped it off. So from now on, hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell. You'll get notified Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Pray the Rosary. Be the Maccabee. Go up into the attic and read the documents, folks. Find out about the dogma, the doctrine, the ecumenical councils, the real stuff. Tim? And be be pastoral, people. No, be doctrinal. <laughs> be doctrinal. Be they tell you to be, be pastoral. Dog, dogmatic is negative, too, isn't it? Be yeah. dogmatic. Yeah, dogmatic is negative. I'm like, dogmatic is good. This is the source of the thing. Yeah, I like dogmatic. Be dogmatic. Don't be pastoral. Be, That's there right. we go. Be dogmatic. Don't be pastoral. Signing off. Hey, this is Dr. Taylor Marshall. I'm leading a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and I would like to invite you. This pilgrimage is unique because it's based on the daily Mass in the extraordinary form. And our chaplain is the well-known preacher, Father John Hallwell. I'll also be giving teachings from my book, The Crucified Rabbi, about how Christ in the Catholic Church fulfills the Old Testament. 
We'll also be renewing our vows at the Jordan River, our marriage vows at Cana, and having mass at all the sacred sites, including the Holy Sepulcher of our Lord. 2019 is considered to be one of the safest times to travel to the Holy Land, but space is limited. So please sign up at pilgrimages.com forward slash Taylor Marshall, and I'll send you a free signed copy of my book, The Crucified Rabbi, to prepare you for this once in a lifetime pilgrimage. I look forward to meeting in the Holy Land and praying with you. Till then, God bless.